going to talk to you a little bit about making, the act of creation. The act of creation is so core to who we are as humans. As people, we constantly want to express ourselves. We often do that by making things. It's something that we have an inherent relationship to. So oftentimes in our lives, the act of making, the act of creation is removed from our daily lives. The way that we consume goods, even the way that we learn, oftentimes is very divorced from the actual act of getting our hands into something and making it, being the creators. We have a plethora of options as consumers, and we're quite good at being consumers. There are plenty of options for us. And while it might seem that we have such a wide variety of things that have been made for us and things that we can choose from, if we stop for a moment and think about what actually lines these shelves, most of it is actually made by a very small percentage of the world. So really, only a few people are making the vast majority of what we all use. So when we need something or we want something, rarely do we go home and decide that we will create it, we'll design it, we'll invent it. Oftentimes, our default approach is to figure out where to buy it. So hopefully the store will have what we need, but oftentimes, despite having so many things to choose from, the options lack personalization. They lack individualization. So what about the audience of one? How do we decentralize manufacturing in a way that allows for all of us to be the designer, the producer, and the end user. And what can this do for us as people? Well, I think that this picture is incredibly representative of one of those possibilities. This is a boy named Dylan, and what he's wearing is something called a RoboHand. And this RoboHand project is absolutely phenomenal, in my opinion, because what it's allowed Dylan to have and what it's around, allowed children and people around the world uh, to, to do is to create a prosthetic for a few dollars uh, of plastic per finger. Otherwise, this would be in the tens of thousands of dollars. This is a phenomenal uh, open source shared project. It was started by a couple of inventors, one in the uh, Pacific Northwest, another in South Africa. Uh, one of whom had an accident and lost some of his fingers, and he was perplexed by how long the, the cycle of production was taking and how expensive and difficult it was and how what he needed lacked customization. So again, when we can be the designer, the creator, the inventor, as well as the producer and the end user, amazing things are possible, and we can create life-changing inventions in our own homes, in our woodsheds, in our uh, living rooms if we choose. So in 2007, <clears throat> I was introduced to some technology that really changed the way that I looked at the world. Uh, this, this is a laser cutter, this image behind me, but there was a variety of technology. And roughly it all fell under the classification of digital fabrication and CNC uh, gear. And basically these machines allowed, allowed us to come up with an idea, come up with a concept, create it in a computer-aided design program, basically mock it up, draw it up, and then essentially tell the machine, uh, convert that information to code, tell the machine exactly what to do, and within a very, very, very short amount of time, even a very precision item could be produced from this pretty easy, pretty low barrier uh, set of of uh, things that we could easily do and teach others to do. So again, this, this just blew my mind. When I saw 3D printing for the first time in 2007, I was uh, introduced to this by a group called the Center for Bits and Atoms at MIT. This, to me, told me that everything was about to change, that for a couple thousand dollars, someone could have a machine that could make in physical form something that they had invented and come up with only hours before. And I knew that this had incredible opportunities, not just for myself, uh, but for my students and for people around the world. So when we get to be the designer, the inventor, something very special happens. 
not just in the sense that we get to have a tangible object, not, that, that we, not only do we get to see something uh, that we've created, but there's an impact, there's a feedback that we get from seeing that thing actualized. And oftentimes, especially in education, we're looking for how do we shift perception? Not, not only do we want students to walk away with more knowledge and better uh, ability to, to master the skills that we want them to, but we want them to walk away feeling capable. And this idea of how do we make students feel capable is a really hard thing to quantify. We can, we can test them and see if they know the knowledge, but getting them through a process that makes them feel more like problem solvers, more like doers, like makers on the other end of it, is very special. So this picture uh, is very representative of that to me. This is one of the only people in my slideshow who I don't know the name of, and it's because he was a boy that basically walked into our open lab, gosh, about five years ago, and he had an absolute demand of, of us that day. He wanted to make a pair of sunglasses, and that was, he was not going to leave until that happened. And with, <laughs> within a matter of a couple hours, we were able to walk him through, again, a low barrier to access, an easy to use set of, um, of tools, and uh, design, he designed a custom pair of sunglasses, which he's holding here. They are made out of cardboard, and he was quite excited about them, and he took his sunglasses, and he went on about his business. So, um, so there's something special, though. There's something special about being the maker and seeing this happen. So because I have a lot of focus on education, I immediately worked to develop uh, a set of best practices that related to integrating making into education. And this is a, an example of that. In 2008, uh, we conducted summer training intensives, and these were for students primarily from City Heights, and for most of these students, this was their first ever exposure to this technology or even to doing a pro program of this kind, even just a supplementary educational program. And so students were engaged immediately into the process of ideation. They had to come up, they had to solve a problem, they had to come up with a concept, they had to work together in teams, they had to present their ideas, they were responsible to one another, they were inventors. And this student group in particular designed a beautiful structure, uh, a sculptural piece, that for them was their homage to the idea of community power. And you can see, if this uh, image is here, that it's sitting on this table and they're kind of in the midst of a discussion about uh, you know, how they're going to make it. And they did indeed make it. They made a huge nine foot tall in my office <laughs> all day long uh, example of what they felt spoke to the importance of power in their community. And for them, that meant both power as individuals, but also the idea of, of, of electrical power and, and consumption and sustainability. And they even completed it with uh, copper panels that when you touched, you closed the circuit on, and it allowed for a bunch of LEDs to light up, and of course those were solar powered. So again, we want people to feel empowered. So starting with the younger generation, the hope is that we are able to build a next generation of inventors and entrepreneurs and decision makers who are equipped to deal with the pressing questions and issues of the day. This is Vanya. She's one of our uh, students from our 2010 class, and she's absolutely extraordinary. This is her holding a device that she had just recently finished soldering, and uh, she's quite proud of. This is a little a board that goes inside of a, a box and basically allows you to charge your phone on the go. Uh, Vanya's about 13 or 14 years old here, and when I first met Vanya, she, uh, she basically, basically petitioned to be in our, uh, our high school class, and I decided to let her in because she was just so extraordinary, and it turned out that although she was one of the youngest people in the class, she showed up every day. She was surrounded by mostly male students that were, you know, three, four, or five years older than her, and every day she showed up with a different colored bow in her hair, on time, ready to go, because this girl wanted to be an inventor, and she knew what she wanted, and she recognized that she was going to take this uh, and make her own 
solution about her life and decide where she wanted to go. And her goal is to go to UCSD and be a, become a bioengineer. Um, so these are students uh, from another program that we did with YALA, which was a refugee youth um, education grant program. These are all young uh, kids who have, are recent refugees. And this is them learning about electricity and electronics. So we're teaching them things like Ohm's Law, which otherwise might seem really boring. Basically, you know, we're, we're forcing them to do math and understand equations. But of course, you can tell from the looks on their faces that they're having a great time. And that's how I feel that every kid should learn Ohm's Law, is with a big smile on their face, because it's amazing. And so just by doing simple acts of letting them create something themselves, they're able to be immersed in the fun of the activity, the wonder of the science behind it, rather than just bogged down by uh, trying to learn things. So essentially, what we've found is that uh, when we include play, when we include personalization, when we allow people, students of any age, uh, to basically be able to make something based on their own desires, their own, their own specifications, it allows them to, to make the process a lot less painful. And we can, we can teach highly, highly complex subjects. Uh, so in this example, uh, we're basically tricking kids into learning by letting them play with remote-controlled cars. Uh, in this case, what they've actually done is used an open source uh, board called an Arduino, which is basically a little computer brain that you can program. And they've made these little cars into autonomous robots. And their goal is to learn computer science, to learn programming, and learn how to write code in order to make these cars move. So it's summer. They're fifth graders. This could be a really boring and daunting task. But what this image uh, represents is a moment in their learning process where we stopped needing to tell them what to do. We stopped needing to explain to them why, they, why it was important that they should learn how to write this code. Um, this is a moment where they became so immersed in the act of play and the engagement of making that they took it upon themselves to write more code than we had even asked them to do because they were getting excited about the ability to make a course, tell, com program the computer to tell the car how far it should go and then when it should turn and then when it should stop and when it should turn again, that they were getting a thrill out of challenging one another by changing that course and saying, I bet you can't make your car run through it. And then they would almost trip one another running through the door back into the classroom to plug in their little Arduino boards and write more code so that they could go and run it again. And so, of course, as, a, as an instructor, you know, that makes, makes us thrilled. <laughs> um, and so uh, in practicing this approach to learning, we've realized that it also works exceptionally well for adults. It turns out that we like to be tricked into learning, too. <laughs> um, and we like to make things. And we, we like to see the blinky light happen. That makes us very happy as well, sometimes almost more than the kids. Uh, so, so we work with adults, and we we uh, offer a space and, and workshops where people can feel free to ask questions. And in this uh, image, we have several uh, local folks. One of them, uh, Eric down in front, he's a local inventor who's made a, a brilliant piece of hardware that allows you to monitor the consumption of your energy use in your house. And he came in and needed a little extra additional knowledge so that he could have, uh, so that he could gain more engineering skills so that when he hired engineers to produce his product, he had, uh, he had uh, a little more knowledge in that. And so we want, to, we want to boost our local community, not just of young learners, but of adult learners as well. Because as adults, we want to be sure that all of us have access to these amazing machines and all of this knowledge that allows us to make just about anything, and specifically the things that we need and we want, and that enable us to be the inventors. Um, a quick nod to the amazing open source community and uh, exceptionally cheap and easy and affordable machines that are out there now is this little piece of plastic on this image behind me. This might not look like anything terribly exciting, but believe me, in my world, it is. This is from about a week ago. This is a very real story. From about a week ago, 
Uh, I found, <laughs> well, we found ourselves working on a project for a local museum, and we really needed something that would allow us to add a little tension to a drive system that we were creating. So rather than toiling over the development and design and creation and manufacturing of this thing, within one day, we were able to go online to a site called Thingiverse, which is the universe of things, find an already existing chain guide that someone else had 3D modeled for us, download that 3D file, print it up on our also locally made by a local startup less than $700 3D printer overnight, and then have it in the morning so that we could install it and fix our problem. And all of that was done for free. I didn't pay a penny for the design. I probably, the cost was maybe a few dollars of plastic. All said and done one day, so it's very real. I want to impress that upon us. This maker movement is here, and it's real, and we're all a part of it. We can do things that are just expressions of our art, our creativity. It's for fun. These are 3D printed heads. I'm sure all of us would love to have <laughs> one of these of ourselves. And that's just an example of something that we can do just because we want to. But there's also people that are making things that are truly, truly revolutionizing the way that we live and the way that we work. This is an example of folks building something called an open PCR machine. So this is basically, again, a less than, I believe, $700 thermocycler that you can build and make uh, and have to use so that you can do your own DNA sequencing. And as, as ethical hackers, there's nothing better than the ultimate hack, which of course, of course would be your own code, right? So, <laughs> so we're really interested in cultivating this, this local community of makers. And uh, there's never been a better time to be a maker. Things are so accessible. They're so affordable. Uh, there are so many people with great interests that are getting together, sharing their knowledge. Uh, creating environments in which people can work together and people can exchange information and co-develop things. Um, this is a great time to think about localization. How do we create locally? How do we support local inventors and entrepreneurs? How do we work within our regional area to do manufacturing locally so that we can uh, take a chunk out of this big production and manufacturing cycle that causes a lot of waste on, along its shipping lines and everything else? How do we come together to do fun things, like invent new technology that could change the world, or robots that fly because we enjoy watching them? Of course, these are things that also can change the world. Um, this is Chance, one of our local uh, quadcopter meetup folks that uh, host something at the lab. Um, so ultimately, this is a call to action for all of us. When we create, when we invent, when we take the reins on that, when we decide that we're going to make something because we want to, whether that's knitting a sweater, brewing a craft beer, or inventing a robot, or inventing something phenomenal that's going to change the way that we work and live, it's all valid, and it's all an act that it's a simple act that can help us see the world differently and participate in the world differently because we all are inherently makers as humans. So with that, I'll leave you with the electric giraffe, which is an amazing project that I think embodies the maker movement's call to action, which is really a celebration of the do-it-yourself spirit, the spirit of invention that we all pride ourselves on. Um, so this is made by a local guy named Lindsay, and this is like a two-story, enormous uh, robotic giraffe. And the reason why I think this is such a nod to the sort of spirit of the maker movement is because this was really created out of the love of creation. This was made because he wanted to make it, and he takes it out into the world and shares it. And you should see kids when they interact with this thing. It has sensors on its nose, and its eyes light up. And it's absolutely amazing. So there's something inherently powerful about the act of being a maker. And right now is a great time to learn something new and see how it shifts our perspective on the world. Thank you.